So uh, if you have your Bible, let's, uh, let's open it to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is going to be where we're at today. And um, we're going to tackle the beginning of this new series that we're doing called Seek Ye First. Um, we, uh, you know, we don't typically do topical sermon series very often uh, at our church. Uh, we like to stay in books of the Bible. I prefer to stay in books of the Bible. That's kind of the way I like to teach. I feel like that's a good way to make sure you teach everything uh, without picking and choosing what you teach. But, um, but there are times where we choose to teach uh, more topical series, and this is one of those times. And uh, as I was preparing uh, last summer uh, for what we were going to come up against in 2024, uh, I felt like it was important, given that this is an election year, uh, that we take at least a few weeks to discuss uh, what it looks like uh, for a community of Jesus followers who love one another to engage and deal with some difficult things that are going to come our way, whether we like it or not. Uh, just because we live in, uh, in a world that's going to deal with uh, an election this year. And so as we get started, I want to be careful to make sure you guys understand what it is we're talking about and what it is we're not talking about, uh, because I don't really want to, uh, to, to have a whole lot of uh, arguments about this uh, or too many emails to answer about this or anything else like that, although if you want to send your email, go for it, all right? Um, but but here's the deal. Um, I'm not. We're not. We're not going to tell you who to vote for or who you should vote for uh, during this series. We believe that you can pray and seek God's wisdom and God's guidance. You're smart enough to figure that out on your own. And so we're not going to deal with that. Uh, this series is not going to discuss what the Bible talks about or how the Bible addresses hot button topics that are bargaining issues for uh, either side of the election. So you're not going to hear us address abortion or immigration or the LGBT. LGBTQ community or welfare or taxes or anything like that. Uh, there are plenty of good sermons. If you just go and search them online, I'm sure you'll find one that you like and agrees with your opinion, and it'll make you super happy. And and so just just do that, okay? Because I have zero desire to do that. And uh, so our conversation during this series is really going to just center around how Christians are called to live in a nation with a very polarizing political climate like America. And uh, Susan Stokes talks about this. She's a professor of, uh, of political science at the University of Chicago who studies comparative democracies. She says, I see a lot of ways in which our democracy has already deteriorated. In the best case scenario, it would take a while to come back. According to Pew Research, which is a evangelical think tank that kind of does research for evangelicals to take a look at uh, to better understand the landscape of the culture in which we live in, they say that only about 22% of American adults trust in the government to do what is right always or most of the time. Now, that is up from 16% last summer, so maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, uh, but, but that's the world we live in. Now, I want to also be fair by letting you know that I uh, am not a person who really gets into politics. I'm not a political person. Uh, what that means is I don't lean left. I don't lean right. I, th I see a few good things on both sides of the aisle, um, and I see a lot of massive amounts of evil on both sides of the aisle. And I choose to disengage from politics because uh, about 16 years ago, uh, I got involved in kind of this really heated season of life where there was an election taking place. And I realized that I was developing a lot of disdain, a lot of anger, and a lot of hostility toward other followers of Jesus who did not have the same political views or opinions that I held. I realized that my love for and my outspokenness and my um, 
my, my desire to be an advocate for a specific candidate was stronger than my desire and my love for and my desire to be an advocate for Jesus. And my heart, my affections, my hope were all in the wrong place. And I wasn't just losing my religion, but I was losing my soul. And uh, so I decided, you know what? It's, I'm just not mature enough. <laughs> I'm not smart enough. I'm not loving enough or enough like Jesus to engage in this kind of stuff. Now, if you have an opinion, please, I, I'm not saying that everyone who has an opinion struggles with those things, okay? Um, I just personally do, and so I choose to stay disengaged because if I stay disengaged, I can hopefully love anybody and everybody, no matter what their thoughts, views, or opinions might be. And, um, and so that's, that's my personal stance. Uh, however, I am very proud American, I love America. I love the fact that I live in America and I get to enjoy the freedoms that I enjoy, including to be able to say what I just said. <laughs> and, and I, I mean, you, you won't hear anyone yelling louder for our Olympians in their living room than me. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I don't even watch swimming except once every four years. And you know, I'm like standing up screaming at the last 50 meters of these swimming races. My daughter Zoe thinks that swimming is the greatest thing ever now. Uh, you know, I, I, I love America. And I, I try really hard when I see a veteran uh, to, to pay attention and say thank you. And thank you. Thank them for their service. If you have served, I want to just say thank you for the, for the sacrifices that you've made personally so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have and live in the country that we live in. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I'm very grateful for it. I do my very best to follow the laws that are established by our country. I encourage you to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also not blind to the fact that in America we have some ugly things in our history that we haven't always done well or done right that we've fallen short and there are still things in our present in which we fall short. And um, I'm not blind to the fact that America is not a Christian nation. And I don't think it ever will be. And I think that's okay. But I do like to think of myself as a patriot, but I won't let patriotism become an idol. And I'm not going to let it become idolatry. And so I hope that maybe this series will help you with that way of thinking as well. Um, and in high likelihood that I offend someone or that I've already offended some of you, uh, please forgive me. That's not my intention. My intention is not to offend. My intention is not to, to make fun of. I'll try not to make fun of anyone's opinions or anybody's uh, candidate or any particular side. My hope is just that I might present a biblical ideal for what Christians should strive for what Christians should strive for, American or not, and embrace and live out. Okay, that's my goal. And so with that said, we're going to jump in Matthew chapter 6, all right? So Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, this teaching is probably one you guys have heard before. It comes from Jesus' most famous teaching, his Sermon on the Mount, and it says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or, what, or, or about your body and what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not? 
much more clothe you, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we do? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom, his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So if your Bible is like mine, there's likely a heading above of that section that probably says, do not worry or do not be anxious. Um, The word in Greek that that describes the word anxious or worry here, depending on which word is used, is the word merim nao. Okay, can y'all say that? Merim nao. There. Yeah, so this is the word that that the Bible uses for worry or anxiety or even concern. And it's used a couple different ways in the New Testament. If you were to do a word study on this word throughout the New Testament, you would find that it's used in a positive sense, and you would find that it's used in a negative sense, and or at least what I'm going to call a positive sense and a negative sense. In the positive sense, this word is used oftentimes to refer to our, um, our Im- important relationship that we have with others. Uh, For instance, in the New Testament, you will see something like this written, like show concern for one another or care for one another. And that's the word merimnao, okay? When it says show concern or care for or sometimes even love. The idea is, is that oftentimes this word is used in order to talk about our responsibility to actually think about and show some worry and show some care and show some concern for our brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? So that's good, right? Not, not bad. However, the place where it is, it is used like this in Jesus' teaching as well as in the rest of the New Testament is often used to talk about worry and anxiety or fear when it comes to money, possessions, or things of this world. So almost always it's translated as worry when it talks about, or, or anxiety when it talks about things of like this world, things that we would be of, like, like angst or feel angst if we don't have them or don't have enough of them or that, that might cause us some anxiety or worry, okay? And so there is this, there's this way of, I, I think, simply breaking this idea down and looking at this word that's really important and, and to say it more simply would be to say we are encouraged to care and show concern for others and yet be less concerned about the things of this world. Now, I want us to pay attention to this idea of worry and concern as it pertains to to politics because I do think that there is a lot of worry in our world about what's going to take place in a few months. ABC News reports that both Republicans and Democrats are worried about democracy for different reasons, but they're both very worried. They, they hold on to a lot of angst and a lot of worry about what's getting ready to take place and what's getting ready to happen. There's a lot of concern leading up to a season like the one we are about to enter or have already entered, especially when a candidate gets shot at or when one drops out of a race altogether, right? There are so many things and there's going to be so many uh, news outlets and places that are going to be vowing for you to get enamored and feel this sense of worry and this sense of anxiousness. Because honestly, if they, if they can get you to pay attention and they can get you worried, then you're just, now I'm going to try and find the answers as much as I can. I'm going to click on all the links and I'm going to make them a bunch of money. See, the, the reality is, is that um, there, there is a lot of anxiety and worry in our world, no matter whether it's about politics or about anything else. In fact, our world is at an all-time high uh, when it comes to anxiety 
There are higher levels of anxiety within our culture and our society than there ever has been in human history. And, uh, and, and so just telling someone, hey, don't, don't worry. Don't be anxious. You don't have to worry. It, like, that's not going to help anybody. Right? Like, why are you so worried? Like, that's not going to help anybody. That's not the answer. Jesus, in this teaching, he says that anxious people, and if you're wondering, am I anxious? Am I worried? Um, he, he points to, uh, to, he gives a kind of an example of, of behavior of anxious people. In verse 32, he says that they run after all these things. They're running after all of these things. And what are they running after all of these things for? Well, it's to deal with their worry. It's to deal with their anxiety. It's to deal with their fear. And if they can get what it is that they're chasing after, if they can uh, run fast enough and catch up to it and grab a hold of it and hold on to it tightly enough, then that will give them peace. That's the idea. What the biblical writers would call shalom. And I would just say, like, are you chasing after something? I know for me, there are many times where my bank account gets to a certain level, I start to get a little anxious. I start thinking, are there other ways that I can make a little bit more money so that I don't have to be so fearful, so I don't have to be so anxious? Like I chase after something else to, to, to help deal with that anxiety and that stress. Politically, it might be that I'm chasing after a certain agenda or a certain person or a certain candidate to be put into office so that all of my fears and my worries might no longer be there, that I might have a sense of peace but see, here's, here's the reality. Is it doesn't really matter what you're worried about. If you're worried about something that's wrapped up in this world, you are always going to be running after something to give you peace and help you have peace that ultimately, that ultimately will never satisfy. And I want you to understand something about anxiety and worry. It's a mental construct of the future. Worry and anxiety are a mental construct of the future. Kurt Thompson, a psychologist and theologian, says that anxiety, worry, and concern, that's, that's the way we're gonna uh, use this, um, is, is a time feature of the mind. Meaning, anxiety takes place in our relationship to the future, but not any future. It's a future of distress in which I cannot imagine getting out of such distress. Now, some of you are already worried because you're worried about the future and what's going to take place. And some of you are going to be worried uh, after the first Tuesday of November. You're not really worried right now. You're pretty optimistic. But once the first Tuesday of November comes... Like, your tune's gonna switch, and your tune's gonna change. The, the reality is, is that this is, a, this is a future construct. I ran into somebody who, who dealt with this a lot in 2017. In 2017, I was leading a church in Georgia, and there's a lady at our church that we hadn't seen in a while. Uh, for about four or five months, we hadn't seen her. And uh, I had seen her husband. I had seen her two daughters. They were at church almost every week. But I hadn't seen her. I was in the grocery store one day and just happened to pass her in the cereal aisle or some, some aisle in the grocery store, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And I said, you know, hey, we've missed you. I, I'm so, you know, so sad that, you know, you're, you're not at church on a regular basis. We miss seeing you, uh, miss you being there. You know, we've seen your husband, seen your girls. It's been great to see them, but we miss seeing you. And she said, you know, Derek, I just can't go to church. I just can't worship God. I can't pray. I just can't. Because I can't understand why he would let Donald Trump get elected as the president of the United States of America. Now, it doesn't matter who you think should be the president of the United States or not. What I'm saying is, is for her, that was like the world was ending. That one thing was like, how do I continue to live? 
She was so worried about her daughters and what kind of world are they going to live in? What kind of world are they going to grow up in? What kind of experience are they going to have? She's a member of our church. A member of the church. One of your and my brothers and sisters in Christ. Her fears may be completely different than yours. But she still had them and they were very real. And she was very angry with God. Now, you may not be there. I hope you're not there. But I know what this type of anxiety looks like. Of where you see a future distress that you can't imagine getting out of. And what it will cause people to do. Maybe you can think of a time in your life where you were in that future distress. Where you couldn't imagine getting out of the difficult situation that you were in. Maybe it was a season of life when your children were really young. And you just couldn't imagine that like four or five years from now, you couldn't even imagine that far into the future where they might be a little bit more independent. (laughs) Or maybe it was when your children became adults and they left the church. And you couldn't imagine them coming back. Whatever it might be, there are things that, that we get into these spaces. It's always a future construct of the mind it's always when we set our sights on the future or when we can't think of our way out of a bad situation for the future that anxiety and worry begins to develop within our mind and we begin to make these mental maps and come up with these mental frameworks and 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 begin to write these stories that we just can't see playing out any other way But Jesus has an answer. His answer comes in Matthew 6, 33. He says, seek first the kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things that you're chasing after to try and give you peace, the peace that you want, it will be given to you. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and what you're looking for, what you're chasing after will be yours. Now, let me talk about these ideas because we don't use these words very often, right? You don't walk around talking about the kingdom unless you live in England, and you don't walk around talking about righteousness unless you surf off the coast of Australia, right? So, so here's the deal. Um, it, like These words are not words that we throw out unless we're like super uber Christians um, or live in other parts of the world. So the, the, the idea biblically of the kingdom of God is that we, it, it, is a, it is a place Place where we begin to make Jesus king of our life. It's where he is Lord of our life, which means that whether we like it or not, we submit to his ways. When Jesus is king and Lord, it doesn't mean that we get to do um, whatever we want. It means that we do what he says even if it isn't convenient or if it doesn't fit our ideals. It means we submit to his way of life forever and always. That's what it means to seek his kingdom, is to seek a way in which I submit to him in every moment, in every situation, in every circumstance. And what he says goes, whether I like it or not. We don't get to pick and choose what parts we're going to follow. We just follow. Now, this is Jesus' way of repeating what he's already written within the full canon of Scripture. Right In Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says, write these words on their hearts. In Deuteronomy 7, you see then Moses talk about the commands and talk about the law that's to be written on their hearts. 
In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, he says, May you meditate on this uh, day and night, and may you not turn to the left or to the right. Right? David talked about this last week, Psalm 1, where, man, blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or sit in the seat of mockers, but who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night. Jesus says at the end of this sermon, in Matthew chapter 7, in the very next chapter, the very end, as he's closing the greatest sermon of all time, he says, uh, a wise person listens to my words and puts them into practice. They build their life on a foundation of my word and my words. And they don't just know them intellectually, but they live them out every day. That's seeking first the kingdom. That's what the kingdom of God is. And that's where we find the kingdom of God and how we can be kingdom people is in his word and meditating on his word day and night. But I'll tell you this, if you start actually doing the things that Jesus teaches in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, much less the rest of the Bible, if you start actually putting those things into practice, you start building a foundation for your life on those things, your whole life is going to change and it's going to change fast. And your opinion and your views and your thoughts about everything in life are going to change and they're going to change fast. Especially some of your views and opinions on politics. When you start seeking first his kingdom and nothing else matters, a lot of that other stuff is going to change. His righteousness, let's talk about this word righteousness for a second. His righteousness is a way of him saying that we seek having right relationship with God and right relationship with our neighbor, our brothers and sisters, or others and people. Righteousness in the, in the biblical idea is not about being some sort of holy person. It's about trying to do what is right by those people around you because you live in right relationship with God. And so you live in right relationship with God and then you try and love your neighbor as yourself. You try and treat them the way that you would want to be treated. And so what Jesus says is really that the worries of this world, they only come into play when we stop seeking first the kingdom. When we stop seeking first, trying to live in right relationship with him and with others. When we keep the kingdom first and we keep our relationship with him first and we keep our relationship with brothers and sisters first, these worries that we oftentimes get so enamored with, they all find their level. He's saying that that in all of this, if we just desire more of a relationship with him, a better relationship with our neighbor, if we, would, if we would just seek his kingdom, we would find what we're looking for. Life would work out just fine. No matter who's leading Life would work out just fine for all of us if we all just did that. All of us would find peace. And that peace would come into our lives and would surpass our understanding. Which means it really doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. It doesn't really matter what happens in November. If we stay focused on walking with God and neighbor rightly, we'll be fine if it all finds its home in Jesus and his way of life and that's why he says in verse 34 he says therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble on its own I love this idea too because a lot of people think when Jesus teaches or he says something crazy 
People are like, yeah, he doesn't understand. He's naive. He's ridiculous. Who would ever say something like that? Jesus isn't naive. He isn't being ridiculous. He knows the trouble that you're going to face. He knows the trouble that's a part of life, day in and day out. He was a human being. In fact, he went through some of the most troubling things. More troubling things than you and I would ever go through. For your and I, behalf, like our behalf, right? If anyone knows what it's like to go through trouble, it's Jesus. He doesn't have his eyes closed. His eyes are wide open. He's wide awake. And he knows, like, man, there's going to be trouble. He even tells his disciples this. Like, in this world, you're going to have trouble. And he says it here. There's going to be trouble tomorrow. There's going to be trouble today. <laughs> There's going to be trouble in November. There's going to be trouble. Don't worry about it. Seek first the kingdom today. Stay focused today on living in right relationship with God and right relationship with others. Seek first today. Going after those things. Loving your neighbor as yourself. And the more that you give yourself to the right now and the today, the less those worries of tomorrow will peek their ugly head into your life. Stay focused in the right now. And you'll find more peace. You're going to face some troubles today. Stay focused on seeking the kingdom in those troubles today. Tomorrow when you wake up, it'll be a new day of trouble. I don't know what it's going to bring, but I promise you there'll be something. But if you wake up and you say, today I'm going to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, you'll be able to deal with the trouble. Just fine. And all that other stuff will find its level. The more you love your enemies and give to the poor and repay good for evil. Look at other image bearers of God, not um, as anything more or anything less than brothers or sisters. When your eyes um, don't drift to the left or to the right to be enticed. When you, when you let your yes be yes and your no be no. And you just tell the truth. And the truth doesn't have to be inflated so that it sounds better than it really is. The more you recognize the presence of God and you bend your knee and bow down in prayer, knowing that ultimately he is in control and that you are not, the more you will become salt and light in a dark world. And the more beautiful you will be. And all of that, if you do all of that, that might bring trouble of its own, actually. Jesus says that very early on in this sermon. He says, you might face persecution for bringing about this kind of life, for living this kind of life, for being one of these kingdom people. You might be persecuted. But he says, rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad when you're persecuted. Because all the world can do is kill you. Did you ever think about that? All the world can do is kill you. Now, here's the crazy thing. Until followers of Jesus take Jesus at his word on that, until we take him at his word... And we truly embrace the fact that the only thing the world can do is kill us. Until we grapple with this truth, we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle. We're going to be worrisome. And we're going to be anxious about what's about to happen. But when we recognize, oh, I can just seek first the kingdom and his righteousness each day, and all they can do is kill me, even if they don't like it. 
the more we can live the way Jesus invites us to live and be the people Jesus wants us to be. Let me close with this. Jesus uses two analogies in this passage. He uses the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. Okay? He, he talks about them. He says, the lilies of the field and the birds of the air are fed and they're dressed and they're beautiful and they have so much splendor and majesty. What do these things have in common, right? You're thinking like, oh, well, there's the birds of the air and there's the lilies of the field. What, what, are, what are the things that bring these things uh, commonality? Why would he use these two things? They seem to be very different uh, things. Well, so it, let's, if you go back to Genesis chapter one, God is in the business of making his world. He's in the business of being him. He's creating and making beautiful things. And he creates uh, one of these things in day three, and he creates one of these things in day five. And so th these, this is a way of him saying that, look, I brought them into existence. I sustained them throughout their existence. But their creative nature, the, or the nature of them being created by God in Genesis 1, also puts them into the same category as you and I. As things that have been created within this very good and beautiful world. The only difference is, is that they are a fabric of creation, and you and I are the flagship mark of God's created world. That's what Jesus is getting at when he says, how much more valuable are you than they? He created them. He's going to sustain them. But he's always seen you as something more. He's always seen you as something greater. He's going to take care of you. Just trust him. Just trust him to take care of you because you're his sons and his daughters, his beautiful image bearers and whom he loves so deeply. He wants to have a relationship with you. He delights in you. He wants you to be a city on a hill that gives light to this dark world. That's what he created you for. You can do that better than any other fabric of creation. You can bring his way of life here on earth as it is in heaven better than anything else in creation. And that's what he wants for you. And that's what he wants for me. And can I just make maybe a statement that would upset some of you, but I hope it doesn't. I hope you understand what I'm saying when I say this. We gotta stop we got to stop giving our job away and asking the government to do it. we got to stop looking for, for policy and system to bring light into a dark world. You and I are meant for that. We're created for that. We don't, it doesn't matter who's in office. We can still do that job. We don't need somebody else to do it for us. We can do it ourselves. It's our job as Christians, as those who are saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. It's our job to make this world a better place. To make this world a more kingdom-like place. And so if what we do each day is we wake up and we'll seek first the kingdom, 
and His righteousness. If we'll do that every day, we don't have anything to worry about. No matter what happens today or tomorrow or in November. You guys believe that? My hope and my prayer is that you do. That doesn't mean that you might not still have an opinion. That you might not want to express that opinion. That you might believe that certain things are going to also make this world a better place. But no matter what, the only thing you're really responsible for is yourself. And you seeking first his kingdom. And you bringing forth his righteousness. That's your job. And no one else can do it for you. And if we do it together, we can change the world. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. And we thank you for just the opportunity that we have to believe in your design to believe that you've created us to live in this world to seek first your kingdom to seek first your righteousness God that your desire and your design was that we might reflect your image bring light into this dark world and so, God, may we, may we wake up each day knowing what it is to, to live for you and live with you, to love our neighbor, to treat others the way they desire to be treated, to show care and concern. to walk in your ways. God, give us your spirit to empower us each day. Empower us today and tomorrow for the troubles that we might face. God, we do pray for those who lead our country we pray for those who lead our cities and our states. God, we pray that you would raise up leaders within our government that are kingdom-minded individuals who are more concerned about doing things your way than the American way. But God, even if that never happens, may that be always our concern and always on the forefront of our hearts and our minds. May that be always our desire. We pray this and hope for this in Jesus' name. Amen.